It's time for Speed 77 Radio's Motor Sports Madness. Powered by the staff at Race Chaser Online. Today's racing news. Yesterday's racing history. And now, here are your hosts, Jacob Seelman, Tom Baker, and Kyle Magda. From the Charlotte Motor Speedway, we welcome you into the Race Chaser Online Roundtable and say good evening. I'm Jacob Seelman, along with Tom Baker, James Pike, and Kyle Magda. And this is Motorsports Madness here on the Performance Motorsports Network, the voice of motorsports. And I'm looking out the window here at the Media Center at Charlotte. It is currently raining, so we are not bringing you much That's an any understatement. action <laughs> right now from the 22nd running of the Bojangles Summer Shootout because, well, there's no cars on track, at least not to this point. We'll wait for the lightning to clear out, and we will wait for the rain to let up a little bit before we at least put Legends cars on the track tonight. But in the meantime, we got a lot of motorsports to talk about from across the spectrum. So, Tom Baker, I will start with this. Joey Logano offered a two-word summation of the past month and Sunday at the Brickyard 400. I guess Kyle's back. That was four words. Sorry, he just said Kyle's back. Oh, okay. Well, you Close said, enough. okay, so the Sorry. accurate quote is two words. You expanded it into I four. I expanded it. I got you. Okay, well, now that we've well, now that we've successfully done our word count, uh, yeah, I guess Kyle's back all right. He, you know, this is a very different Kyle Bush from the Kyle Bush that we've seen uh, up, up to the point where he got hurt. This Kyle Bush is a very mature Kyle Bush. This Kyle Bush is a very relaxed Kyle Bush. This Kyle Busch is a very purposeful and determined Kyle Busch. And this Kyle Busch takes his time, stays in contention, keeps himself out of trouble, and at the end of the race just finds another gear and goes. And, and this Kyle Busch has 11 less Sprint Cup Series races on his body than the rest of the field has all of that, in my mind, equals Kyle Busch makes the chase, and Kyle Busch becomes the odds-on favorite to win the chase at this point. Well, I am not going to disagree with that statement at all, Tom, but I am also going to say that not only is Kyle Busch the odds-on favorite to win the championship, but James, what he did on... Sunday afternoon in the closing stages of the Brickyard to win his fourth race of the season and third in a row, I might add. Basically, he made his spot in the chase all but a formality at this point. It's not if he's going to get into the top 30 in points. He has a chance to do that this weekend at Pocono, and my bet is he does it pretty simply. He has made up 150 points on 30th place in the standings in five races. He made up 35 by himself by winning the Brickyard 400. It's not if, it's when. Yeah, I think you can look at this a million different ways and pick whatever stats you want to summarize this run, if you will. But the one that keeps jumping out to me and the comparison that keeps popping up in my head, if we go back to the summer of 2005, when Tony Stewart had a stretch of five races where he won three of them, and didn't finish any lower than sixth in any of those five. No one has put together a string in the summer like that until now with Kyle Busch. I, I was hesitant last week to make the comparison, though it was in my head. I wanted to wait for the marquee win that Tony had. Tony got the July race at Daytona in Indianapolis that year. Kyle didn't have anything yet. Now he's got that. Now I think it's, it's just a matter of uh, how many more wins can he rack up how many more points can he go clear of the field to start the chase with the win bonus? And what can he do? Is this finally the year where he puts it together in the chase and shakes whatever blues have been so readily apparent and so troublesome for him when we get to the fall months and years past? Is this the year, maybe, where we start talking about Kyle Busch as a Sprint Cup champion at long last? It may well be, and I think that's the debate that we're going to have the rest of this season. Is this the year where, despite the circumstances, everything finally comes together? It came together on Sunday, and Tom, of all his 33 career Sprint Cup victories, he never had one of the crown jewel races, really. He won the Southern 500 in 2008, and I would argue at that point the race had lost some of its luster 
that has now come back with that race returning to Labor Day weekend this year. But now he's got one of the biggest three races that are on offer, the Daytona 500, the Brickyard 400, and the Coca-Cola 600, in my mind, are the big three nowadays. And Kyle finally has one of those, picks up his first win at IMS over the weekend, and, you know, not just cements his place in the, in the battle for the championship, but really proves that the Sprint Cup side of his career is on a massive upswing finally. You know, we used to call him the king of the minor leagues. I don't think you can say that anymore. I think Kyle's proven he can win on the biggest stage again. Well, yeah. I mean, you're right. But I don't think that Kyle ever couldn't win on the biggest stage. I just think that, again, I think he's a different... He's come back a different driver. He's come back a more mature driver. Um, And I think at this point in, in, in his life with having uh, the child and, and, you know, being married and then having his love taken away from him for a while, I think he's, uh, as he said on, on Sunday after the race, he's in a happy place. Now he's, he's kind of found his happy place and, that's kind of scary for the competition, honestly. I, I, to me, that's uh, I think if we had seen this Kyle Bush for his entire career, um, I really think Jimmy Johnson would have a few less championships. I, I this Kyle Bush is going to be very tough, James, to stop. Um, not to say he'll win the rest of the races, of course. That's a almost a ridiculous statement. Not that uh, when you look at what he's done lately, you you, you start to wonder, but. Certainly, he won't win out, but he he's going to be a force for the rest of the season, and he's going into this championship on a mission. And for those who think, James, who have the opinion that Kyle Busch doesn't deserve to be in the chase, um, I, nonsense, in my opinion. He's working within the rules. NASCAR made the exception for him, and I think it's great that we have a system where a driver can get hurt, miss some races, come back and do what Kyle Busch has done and earn his way back in. I mean... You know, gosh, dog, he deserves to, to, to have that that situation for what he's accomplished in the last uh, six or seven races in my book. He's won four of the last five. I was about to say, can you really justify, I think, from an ethical standpoint, denying a chase bid to the man who is on pace to win the most races in the regular season? I think he's currently tied with Jimmy. Uh, with four, with yeah. Four, so. uh, but I, I want to go back very quickly to the point about Kyle already being good enough to win races and never really losing his ability to win in the Sprint Cup Series. Just a fun little stat, especially when it pertains to Indianapolis and why I think in some cases this may have been a win that we could have seen coming regardless of whether or not he was on a hot streak. In the last five races at Indianapolis, the man who has earned the most points at Indianapolis is Kyle Busch. So he's done everything but win. Exactly. Until, yeah, until Sunday yeah. afternoon. He had finished runner up in two of the last three. So it is not, you know, it's this is one of his better tracks to begin with. So just one of those things that you keep an eye on going forward. And Kyle Magda, I will turn to you as opposed to Kyle Bush, the guy who probably should have won the race and didn't, is almost cooling off because. What it comes down to is Kevin Harvick, since his two wins, he's finished second now. He finished third on Sunday. What's it going to take to put this four car back in victory lane? Yeah, guys, and unlike Charlotte, where it's raining right now, it's actually sunny here in Pennsylvania, so thank, thankful for that. But, uh, you know, Pocono is this week, and for Kevin Harvick, I mean, usually he's dubbed the closer, but guys... I didn't see the closer show up there at the end of the race. I think it was Kyle Busch who was the one who was the closer uh, for that race. So, uh, But I, I think going into Pocono this weekend, you know, we're running the same pack as we were at June. Uh, and Kevin ran very well in that race. Didn't leave the most laps, but had a good car on the longer runs. So uh, I'm going to be interested to see how they do. I honestly think he's the early favorite right now going into that race. I don't think it's Kyle Busch at the moment. Because uh, Kevin has shown speed at Pocono. Much like Kyle Busch not winning at the Brickyard, Kevin has never won at Pocono, at least in the Cup Series. Uh, so there's a lot that can go on here. Um, so I, I think looking into this weekend, you know, you have to look back at the players we had back at Pocono. You know, we're not we're on a different package this weekend. And 
Uh, you know, there's just so many, you know, things that, you know, I think this is kind of a benchmark for NASCAR, you know, to compare the two packages, you know, Indy versus Pocono, and then uh, we have the road course of Watkins Glen, so there's still a lot of questions out there in whether Kyle Busch can keep his hot streak going or not. Well, the current package, uh, the, the package they're running at Pocono, I think it's the same one they ran there last time. Yeah. I think. I mean, Correct. We're not you know, changing anything so, for Pocono. Yeah, we're not doing anything different. So, I mean, I, 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 mean, say that. I think the package at Indy... Um, in my in my opinion, it was, was bad. It, yeah, it was bad. It was now, and we got to keep in mind too. Uh, and those for those who are listening to us, that wasn't NASCAR's idea. That was the drivers that came up with that that high drag package. They wanted to try it. They were hoping it would make the racing better. Um, not everything you try is going to be a gem, and that surely wasn't. I think I'm sure they'll try it again, but with some tweaks, uh, further tweaks to. Uh, to possibly make it a little more effective. But, you know, that Indy's just a very, very tough track for the stock cars. The way it's configured, the shape of it, um, it's going to be very hard to come up with a package, honestly, that, that puts on the kind of racing in Indianapolis that we all would like to see. It's a big old track. Um, and so I'm not really sure, Jacob, uh, what you do there, but that package certainly didn't get it. <laughs> No, it really didn't, even though the lead changes were up just a little bit. I think that was more to pit strategy yeah. than, than anything else that we saw. I would agree. We'll, we'll continue debating the package, the rules, the Cup Series, Indianapolis, headed to Pocono this weekend, which you can learn some things about by looking at Indianapolis. Oh, boy. We'll take all that into consideration and continue on with Motorsports Madness right after this. Hey, the rain has stopped at Charlotte Motor Speedway, too, so we might get some racing in yet tonight. From CMS, the home of the Bojangles Summer Shootout, you're listening to Motorsports Madness on the Performance Motorsports Network, the voice of motorsports. We're growing like crazy and need account reps who know their way around agencies, the Internet, and social media. Got connections? Or do you know how to get to the decision makers? Are you fearless? We need you. Internet radio, or as we call it, wireless mobile radio, is rapidly becoming the place to be with almost limitless income potential. So contact us to get involved with the fastest growing professionally produced group of internet radio stations in the world. Your imagination is the only limit here. Call 717-749-0444. That's 717-749-0444. Or you can email us at scorpionradiogroup at gmail.com. You want to ask for Sue. Okay, so Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, and my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. If you're a gearhead and you just can't get enough of your favorite motorsports on that channel on the cable, or you look at that guy network and you just go, what does that have to do with me? We have the answer. Performance Motorsports Network. Right here on the internet. The best cruising tunes. The best in motorsports programming. And the best shows. We have opinionated hosts and we like it that way. If you want to get involved, if you want to bench race, be listening for information coming up soon right here on this channel, the Performance Motorsports Network, your source for motorsports. Hi, this is Tommy Barrett, driver of the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour. Now back to more race talk from the Speed 77 radio crew on the Performance Motorsports Network. Welcome back to Charlotte Motor Speedway and Motorsports Madness here on the Performance Motorsports Network. Jacob Seelman, Tom Baker, James Pike at the proverbial round table with Kyle Magda joining us remote on remote from 
Pennsylvania. We are glad to be here with you for another hour and 45 minutes or so, and we've got a lot of motorsports conversation left to get to. Before the break, we were talking about the rules package that we tried, and nobody really liked it, with good reason, because not only did it not really improve the racing, Tom Baker, it also posed another problem that nobody really anticipated before the start. The spoilers were so big on the back ends of these Xfinity and Cup cars, because they both ran the same package this weekend, that it blocked so much airflow from getting underneath the cars that it was heating up the bottoms of the cars, making more heat in the driver's compartments. And we almost had some medical issues at the end of it after the Xfinity race especially. I mean, even Kyle Busch in victory lane was flat on his back on the pavement afterwards. Yeah, it was kind of nuts um, and very unexpected. And I think sometimes you have to run. You you, you know, you, you don't know all of the side effects until after you test them in racing conditions and um this package was never tested so i think that was that whole effect of the heat was something that was totally unsuspected by everybody involved and really caught everybody off guard indianapolis is always a hot race anyway uh thankfully on sunday to a much better day for the drivers, much more comfortable day. One, it was a cloudy day, so it kept the temperature down a little bit. But two, they were also allowed to put the duct work in, in the uh, windows of the cars to allow for more airflow into the driver's compartment. So we really didn't, I don't think we had any major issues on Sunday. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm sure the package... They'll look at it and they'll learn what they can from it, and I, and I'm sure there's obviously a way to solve this problem. Uh, you know, the everybody will get together and they'll make some tweaks and probably try it again. But um, again, I think um, when we go to Michigan, I thought I think they were going to run it, James, that same package. I'm sure we'll see some tweaks to it before that, if they even still decide to run it. Uh, but. You know, unfortunately, like I said before, Indianapolis is a real challenge for the stock cars, and it has been since day one. I think the other part of the problem is that, especially in comparison to the Indy 500, we look at the package that IndyCars got set up with drivers able to just close from out of nowhere half in, halfway down the straightaway. Uh, those cars suck up so well, yeah. and it makes the racing so exciting to watch that when you compare the Sprint Cup package... Uh, it, it almost seems a little bit dull, and I almost feel like it's there's a little bit of a glass ceiling that you, know, you can't really hit and pass because just of the nature of the stock cars and the way they make the way they're and all the science behind that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I will say if if they bring that package to Michigan, it will need some tweaks because if they bring that package to Michigan and they have all that air blocked off in the front of these cars, you usually already get a few engines that blow up in Michigan anyway. I figured that that number maybe doubles if we have that sort of that is, that is a good point, Jacob. It's a very good point because it's it's one of those things that you you continue to keep an eye on going forward here, and it's one that we'll watch because Michigan's only about you know a week and a half away. You get done with Pocono, and you get done with the Glen, and then you're right on top of Michigan. So we don't have a lot of time to figure this out and get it where it needs to be. In the meantime, though, the one thing we haven't really even talked about is the fact that, you know, not only did Kyle Busch win the Brickyard 400, Kyle Busch, Kyle Magda, swept the weekend. Hey, there we go. I like that analogy, Kyle and Kyle. Yeah, they like the Kyle and Kyle show, you know. But, uh, yeah, I you know, get the brooms out. Kyle Busch does it again. You know, the old Kyle Busch is back. <laughs> Uh, winning wise, but yeah. more than ever uh, now. But uh, and guys, by the way, you know we're talking about that. Kyle Busch will be returning the Truck Series this week at Pocono, so uh, oh, you know boy. something else to to add. And uh, but still, there's a lot of drivers that are going to be in that race as well. So it's not only going to be Kyle. But I digress. Yeah, Kyle Busch. I mean, I did see the end of the race. I caught it yet uh, Sunday, and uh, looks like uh, you know he just got uh, Ryan Blaney a little bit loose and. Passed him on the last lap, and it's it's very rare that you see a last lap pass at the Brickyard in any series, uh, except for IndyCar. But uh, you see that, and uh, I mean Ryan lets a lot of that race as well. It was pretty much the two contenders that have been the owners' championship for the last two years going at it in the end. So uh, yeah, we saw some of Kyle Busch, and since he's been back, I think his worst finish, with the exception of Daytona, is third. 
or excuse me, fourth at Loudon. So, uh, guys, I think it's safe to say Kyle is back because all he does is win. Like I say with that yeah. meme with Skip Bayless uh, every week. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be interested with the trucks this week to see he can, he can continue that to another series. Just only reason I say that is because you have guys like Kevin Harvick, Brad Keselowski, Austin Dillon also running the race as well. So. That's going to be really interesting, uh, being that race. You know whether he can go back like he did with the excuse me the Xfinity series and win out back in that in that truck. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Kyle Busch is just on a roll as of late, and uh, you know we won't see him in any Xfinity car at Iowa. But I think you know the Watkins Glen will be a pretty good chance. So Kyle Busch is on a roll, guys. Yeah. And right now it looks like no one has been able to stop him. And guys, one more thing: three wins in the last three weeks with three different rules packages. Just think about that as well. Well, there there yeah. there's a moment. He shared that Kyle talked about that victory lane, uh, uh, the uh, the fact that that was he he actually that was one of his goals was to see if he could win with all three rules packages. They went in with that idea. He pulled it off. That's what I'm saying. This Kyle Bush is a scary Kyle Bush for the competition because it's almost as he if he's found he a whole other level, you know, and wow. You know, and Adam Stevens has done a great job with crew chiefing the car, too. Adam Stevens is a brilliant crew chief. He really I've is. said that from the very beginning. And, it, I, you know, he, we saw what he and Kyle were able to accomplish in the Xfinity series. Putting them together on the cup side is a complete another dimension that these two have been able to unlock. It's been great to watch. And, you know, the other thing, James, looking back at the Xfinity race real quick, it just... I couldn't believe how despondent Ryan Blaney was after that race. I mean, there is some, yes, that I could see him putting on his shoulders, but to take all the blame for coming up short like that, I was really stunned by, because if there's anything to blame on why he lost that race, it's the lap car that he came up on with about two to go that killed his momentum and allowed Kyle to get within drafting range in the first place. Yeah, and I, I think that just goes back to the nature of racing in Indianapolis. It's a very narrow track. It's difficult to pass, and especially we saw it with the likes of Tony Stewart and Carl Edwards on Sunday. If you get trapped on the outside, you're just you're toast. You're going back at least 10 spots if you've got cars lined up like Ducks in a Row. But, yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit of just bad luck, nature of Indy racing, and then, you know, just – Another testament to the prestige of Indianapolis and yes. all of the history that you have at a facility like that. When you've got one of the few places this series visits that you can stack right up with the likes of Le Mans and Suzuka and oh, Silverstone and you know, name your famous race course of the world here type thing. Uh, Monaco. Monaco, yeah. yeah. When, when you lose one that close at a track like that, it's going to hurt a little bit more than it does at most places, Tom. And that's, I think, exactly. I mean, Ryan, you know, he, he, he races to win. Ryan is, he, he's, he's quiet. I mean, he's not the most boisterous guy in the pit area. Right. He internalizes a lot. And for him to know that he had that race in his pocket, I mean, that was his race to win. And to go into the corner and just simply overshoot the corner, I mean, he just messed up. It, it really, um, it, it was really unfortunate. And But I think it's a credit, Jacob, to Ryan Blaney that he took it on himself and said, look, that one was my fault. He didn't blame anybody else. He didn't blame circumstance. He, didn't blame, he said, look, I just messed up. Ryan Blaney's going to win a lot of races in his NASCAR career. Um, and this one getting away from him will probably only make him more determined. And oh, by the way, he's back in the car again at Iowa this weekend. Look out. Uh huh. And you, you just made a point that I was going to make in about, oh, an hour from now. So, uh, hold, hold tight to that and you'll see that return a little bit later. In the meantime, of course, you know, all this at Indianapolis over the weekend and, the prestige and you know everything that goes along with the brickyard james you know we talked about it earlier with kyle bush it's a crown jewel race and it's one that some guy from pittsburgh that was making his final start in the race has won five times and unfortunately jeff gordon's quest for a six brickyard win ended very early on lap 51 after a caution for balloons yes balloons 
Gordon and Boyer get together, gee, where have we heard that before? And he's in the garage area with a busted up race car, and I was disappointed to see that. I wanted to see the 24 maybe go out with a bang and get the six-pack at Indianapolis. It wasn't meant to be, but he's still in great position to make the chase. Hey, gosh, he just needs a win. Yeah, that's that's the one thing that keeps jumping out at me when I think of Jeff's season. He's had a string of very solid performances and just hasn't had the win to back them up and the win that would really solidify his place in the chase. Uh, that being said, I still think that there's a little bit more room to go, not to say that he has to jump straight up to Kyle Busch levels immediately to save his season, but uh, you feel like there's a little bit more speed in that 24 that they can drag out of that car, and I think these next few weeks will provide a few good chances for him to do it because they're tracks where Jeff historically has been very successful. He's, he's won at Pocono. He's won at Michigan. He's won at Watkins Glen. It's not you. like he can't turn it around. Exactly. It's not like he can't turn it around. And speaking of Pocono this weekend, really quickly, Tom, I will go to you because though it's a track where historically maybe you haven't seen Kyle Busch light the world on fire, he does have a teammate that's won there four times. I imagine that 18 crew will be leaning a little bit on some of the expertise that Denny Hamlin can provide at Pocono in their quest to go four in a row, something that only Jimmy Johnson in the past decade has done in the Cup Series. Well, you know, and... If you look at the stats for Pocono, in the last nine Pocono Sprint Cup races, Chevrolet has won seven of them, dating back to 2011. Uh, Denny wow. Hamlin, Denny Hamlin, was one of the exceptions in the Toyota camp. In fact, I think he he might have been both of the exceptions uh, in the Toyota camp. The last time a Ford actually won was in 2010, June of 2010, when Greg Biffle did it. And so, you know, it's pretty much been a Chevrolet show uh, at Pocono with Martin Truex, of course, picking up the win a little earlier in the year. But I, again, I think you've got to throw out that stat. you got to look at what's going on now and who's performing well now. And certainly Kyle Busch, Carl Edwards, who, by the way, has also won at Pocono, and Denny Hamlin are all going to be solid contenders. I don't expect to see anyone outside of the quote-unquote usual suspects. Uh, your Kevin Harvick's, Jimmy your Johnson. Kurt Bush's, your Jimmy Johnson's. You know, um, those are the and guys. Yeah, those are the guys that you're going to have to. Truex will be, I'm sure, be right back in the mix again. Um, and you know, those are the guys you're going to have to look for. Um, the the uh, the, the Keslowskis and the Loganos, I'm sure, will be in there as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. It will be interesting. You got long-winded on me. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to shift gears, and we're going to go to open-wheel conversation. Joel Sebastianelli joins us in a moment from Charlotte Motor Speedway, home of the Bojangles Summer Shootout. You're listening to Motorsports Madness on the Performance Motorsports Network. Here's an important message from Rad and this station. Hi, this is Bob Sheehan from Blues Traveler for Rad, recording artists against drunk driving. I like to party just as much as the next guy, maybe even more, but the one thing I won't do after I've had a few is get in the car and drive. Don't blow it. Always choose a designated driver. Remember, music lives and so should you. Motorsports sales professionals. Performance Motorsports is looking to build a team of experienced media sales professionals to represent our programming to the industry's top companies, magazines, and racing series. If you have motorsports sales or marketing experience, know how to work with agencies, understand social media, and are incredibly creative when it comes to working with clients and promotions, then we want to hear from you. Top performers are richly rewarded. Your imagination is the only limit here. Call 717-749-0444. That's 717-749-0444. Or email us at scorpionradiogroup at gmail.com. You want to ask for Sue. You are a waste. A loser. Everyone hates you. Why don't you just stay in your car and keep driving? I'm serious. Drive until you run out of gas and get out of your car and walk until you find someone who doesn't think you're dumber than bricks. Could take a while, but at least all that walking might burn a couple of calories. You may not witness bullying like this every day. Your kids do. They want to help, but they don't know how. Visit StopBullying.gov to learn safe, simple ways your child can help stop bullying. Be more than a bystander at StopBullying.gov. A message from the Ad Council. 
You own a performance car and you know how to drive, but you want to learn real performance driving. Well, Bunky, get that car off the street and onto the track. Summit Point Motorsports Park, the Mid-Atlantic's premier road racing facility, located just over an hour from D.C. in nearby Summit Point, West Virginia, is the place to go. And you'll find that Friday at the Track is going to give you what you need. For less than a monthly car payment, you can attend this regularly scheduled one-day instructional event in your street car on one of Summit Point's three world-class road racing circuits. You'll receive classroom instruction, skid pad instruction in their cars, including including front and rear skid control, and four 20-minute in-your-car instructional sessions from a professional instructor. Have fun, go fast, and really learn how to drive. Call 304-725-8444 for class schedules and details. That's 304-725-8444, Friday at the track at Summit Point Motorsports Park. Time now for Open Wheel Central with our resident wine and cheeser, Joe Sebastianelli. Here to pop the cork is Race Chaser Online's managing editor, Jacob Seelman. And I will pop that cork along with saying welcome back to Motorsports Madness. We are live from the Charlotte Motor Speedway, home of the Bojangles Summer Shootout. Round 9 racing action getting ready to get underway here in a couple minutes. Just finishing dry on the track and then we'll put cars on it. And if you want to watch the action and you might not be in the Charlotte area, head to GoPRN.com for the live webcast. Tonight and tomorrow night, the final two races of the summer for Legends Car and Bandolero drivers, and it's going to be a barn burner. We're, we're looking forward to watching that tonight and tomorrow, Tom. But Joel, barn burner? That's about the only way I can describe the action that we saw Sunday morning at a reasonable time for those of us on the East Coast for a change. The Hungarian Grand Prix had everything we've been waiting for all season long. It had parity. It had a Ferrari in victory lane, both Mercedes off the podium, and almost the youngest podium finisher in F1 history. And I sit back and say to you, my friend, are you kidding me? That was awesome. I mean, anybody who says that Formula One isn't exciting clearly just hasn't watched the right races. I mean, they've only stuck in there for one. I mean, I would still argue that overall, the entertainment value in F1 is on par with anywhere else in the world. Uh, not always the best battle up front. Not always the most parody. But here, it was so unpredictable. And first of all, on any track, like this, where there's not as much emphasis on engine power. It's going to bunch the field up a little bit more. It's going to add some parity, but this just wasn't just an issue of parity. This was anything that could go wrong would, it seemed like, for Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg as the day went on, and they still recovered to finish 6th and 8th, respectively. Sebastian Vettel picking up the win in Ferrari, and then Daniel Ricciardo and Danny Kvyat both finishing on the podium, with Kvyat finishing in second, and not to mention, too, there was a time penalty added to Max Verstappen at the end. Didn't matter anyway, but uh, Verstappen actually could have finished on the podium if the damage from contact with Nico Rosberg was enough to bump Daniel Ricciardo out. So when you look at the top four, if you had just bet on a parlay here, one, two, three, four, like you would in horse racing, Vettel, Kvyat, Ricciardo, and Max Verstappen, oh, and fifth, Fernando Alonso in the McLaren, you'd be making big money. This is, I think, the most unlikely top five, given the circumstances that I can remember in F1 in a very, very long time. Yeah, and I want to talk about Fernando first for a minute before I, I circle back to uh, actually Danny Kvyat, but Alonso, not only is it McLaren's best result of the season, not only is it his personal best result of the season, but this was an unbelievable breakout for a team that I thought wasn't going to be anywhere on the map except for maybe Monaco all year long. Joel, I know they've been burning some engine tokens to try and get caught up to everybody else. This was a massive, massive step in the right direction for that team. It is, I think, especially from a reliability standpoint, too, because in Q2, a day before, Fernando Alonso was actually the only McLaren to make it there, by the way. Button was eliminated before, and his car stopped on track. The engine shut down, so he actually literally ran with the car, pushing it back to the garage. 
uh, along with the help of some of the track marshals. Now, due to regulations, he wasn't allowed to come back out and finish the session, unfortunately. But the fact that the car was able to last that long, quite frankly, with the way McLaren and Honda performed this year, that's not a given. That's not something you can take for granted. So it seemed as though the two McLarens were the only ones who actually stayed out of trouble all day, along with Sebastian Vettel. It seemed like everybody else, even if it was just a close call or you know going a little bit wide on a corner, it seems like everybody had a moment at some point, worse than others, except for Fernando Alonso and Jensen Button. They kept their noses clean, P5 and P9. It's a really impressive result for McLaren. It's an impressive result for McLaren, Joel, and it's one that puts both cars in the points for the first time since they went to Honda. I mean, how much confidence does this give the team that finally they have something they can build off of? And for both Alonso and Button, who have been floundering all year, it's got to make them feel a little bit better that they actually look like race car drivers again. Yeah, no, I think it gives the drivers more confidence than anything else to be hanging around like that. Because I think while it's certainly a confidence boost to make it this far, to finish as high as they did and combine between the two of them to pick up 12 points on the weekend, yes, it's big, but big picture. I mean, obviously, they still have the reliability issue, even though it held up for both of them. Uh, during this race, and you consider the fact that Massa and Botas both had issues in the Williams, that Kimi Raikkonen probably would have finished on the podium if not for the power unit failure. Uh, you know, Sergio Perez and Nico Hulkenberg and Force India have been pretty consistent inside the top 10 for most of this year, but Nico was involved in an accident with his front wing uh, completely collapsing under the car, sending him into the tires in turn one. Sergio Perez's brakes acted up and that's why he ended up retiring from the race and that, none of that is to take away from McLaren because they deserve the credit for making it that long for staying out of trouble but I don't know how much we can infer as far as their performance in other races you know looking at a track like Spa Francorchamps where they're going to go in uh, just one month's time for the next race in Belgium I, I think at the Belgian Grand Prix a track that can be a ab more abusive to the engine. I mean, you're, you're running flat out, you're putting a lot of pressure on the brakes in certain corners. At a track like there, there are still going to be plenty of concerns for Honda and for McLaren, and I wouldn't be gambling on them for securing a points finish there either. But to finish fifth and ninth is a serious accomplishment, and even if it doesn't give them anything else but confidence, I think that's still a lot more than they had before. One driver who looked to be on the opposite side of that coin and instead of confidence I think went goes into the summer break a little rattled to be honest was Nico Rosberg and James you and I have, were talking about Nico earlier and it was just one of those really uncharacteristic mistakes for him over the course of the race and like Joel said a series of bad luck incidents for the whole Mercedes AMG Patronus team but Nico especially that was just what happened to him after hoping that he was going to make up a huge chunk of points to Lewis Hamilton, and he ends up losing ground in the standings. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny how that works out. I look at that, and part of me agrees with you, and part of me says that that's definitely just kind of a bad luck case. I mean, especially on exit of turn two in that particular spot, uh, it can be tricky to spot anybody that's to your outside, and if you end up, you know, clipping wings and tires getting shredded and so on and so forth, these things happen, but... There's another part of me that kind of wonders, in a bigger picture sense, maybe I'm crazy to think this, but do we think that just the fact that Lewis has generally gotten the better of Nico over the past few years since he made the move to Mercedes, has that gotten to a point where it might be in Nico's head a little bit? He might be trying just a little bit harder than he needs to to actually gain the ground that he needs to on Lewis? I mean, I think realistically, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, for all of the talk, it seemed like last year, where I think there was this consensus that Lewis Hamilton wasn't mentally strong enough, and that Nico would be the one who is stronger. And that was the case maybe even after Belgium, we all thought that. But then at the end of the year, taking six of the last seven races, Lewis Hamilton did. Uh, you know, for Nico, he was the one who made those mental miscues. I think what ended up costing him in this race, and, you know, in a situation like this, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Uh, 
they wanted to keep Nico on the same strategy as Lewis Hamilton. So strategically, even though he didn't need to use the compound again, he put on a set of medium tires for his final stint. He didn't need to be on that compound. And so if he had been on the soft tires, I think he would have been able to resist Daniel Ricardo's challenge. I don't think Ricardo would have been close enough. And so then, you know, obviously it's that decision results in a domino effect that would affect the entire race. Uh, you know, it's hard to say what would have happened. But maybe he holds Daniel Ricciardo off. Maybe there's not that collision. Maybe because Nico Rosberg would wind up being on the podium, this championship chase is a heck of a lot closer. But now it's just what if, what if, what if, because miraculously, Lewis Hamilton actually added more points to his lead on a day when it seemed like he might not even finish inside the points to begin with. So for Nico Rosberg, it just wound up being a disastrous day. So many what-if moments for him in particular. Nico is probably devastated. I mean, to, to have that be your last race and to show in some ways that he has been mentally affected by performance on the track. I mean, how rough is it going to be for the next few weeks just replaying this race and that moment of contact over and over in your head? Whereas Lewis, on the other hand, has to just take a deep sigh of relief that he made it out of that weekend, not only unscathed, but in a better position than he was when the race started. Spectacular race. It really was, and it ended, like we said at the top, with... Sebastian Vettel on top of the podium, Joel, 41st career Formula One victory, tying him with the late Ayrton Senna for third on the all-time series list. I didn't think that that would happen, at least not, you know, not this soon, I guess, for somebody like a Sebastian Vettel or even a Lewis Hamilton. I figured maybe later in their careers you would see one of those two reach up to those kind of numbers, but to see what Sebastian has done in so short of a time, maybe Schumacher's record isn't attainable, but surely at least to second before the end of his career would certainly be reachable. I definitely think so. I mean, with the season he had last year, I was in a way, kind of surprised that it didn't happen before uh, with the way he's just had these struggles as of late. But now with Ferrari, it seems as though he's found his groove, second victory of the year. Interesting stat, too, as far as when Senna, Schumacher, and Vettel all got to 41 wins, it took Senna 158 starts, Vettel 149, Schumacher 140. So we talked about this the other day. I think that's a cool stat. Doesn't mean that much, but Vettel split Senna and Schumacher right down the middle in terms of how long it took to get to 41. He did, and it means really, honestly, he's on pace, which is something that I think we get to watch even more as his Agreed. career goes on. So right now, we're going to do a little bit of business. We'll come back, wrap Formula One, and talk IndyCar, because they're headed to mid-Ohio this weekend for more racing action. You are listening to Motorsports Madness here on the Performance Motorsports Network, the voice of motorsports. Motorsports sales professionals. Performance Motorsports is looking to build a team of experienced media sales professionals to represent our programming to the industry's top companies, magazines, and racing series. If you have motorsports sales or marketing experience, know how to work with agencies, understand social media, and are incredibly creative when it comes to working with clients and promotions, then we want to hear from you. Top performers are richly rewarded. Your imagination is the only limit here. Call 717-749-0444. That's 717-749-0444. Or email us at scorpionradiogroup at gmail.com. You want to ask for Sue. Every 30 minutes, another innocent person is killed due to a drunk driver. My best friend. My brother. My poor grandchild. My sister. My father. My husband. My mom. <laughs> My mommy. Well, I've been afraid of changing Cause I've built my life around you Stop these tragedies before they happen. Don't drink and drive.
Do you love the sound of high revving motors and the smell of burning rubber? Do you want to get your car sideways right at the ragged edge of control? If you've always wanted to try drifting or learn to improve your drifting skills, Summit Point Motorsports Park, the Mid-Atlantic's premier motorsports facility, has the expert instructors and the specialized track to teach you how to drift and the skills necessary to drift competitively. From skid pad to open sessions, Summit Point Motorsports Park has the safe and open environment that allows drifters of all skill levels, new to intermediate, to get sideways and smoking. With a focus on safety and the skill set necessary to drift competitively, Summit Point Motorsports Park's Drift Nirvana is just the thing for you. Call for your reservation today, 304-725-8444. Or for more information, go online, summitpoint-raceway.com or you can email them at office at bsrinc.com. Drift Nirvana, getting you sideways the right way. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Let's throw the green for Open Wheel Central on Motorsports Madness. Back to Jacob, the crew, and the only racing insider to ever use Snuggies for Dogs in a conversation about IndyCar, Joel Sebastianelli. I'm hoping there's no need for Snuggies for Dogs tonight because there's a lot of good, actually, to talk about IndyCar. But in the meantime, welcome back. Open Wheel Central as a part of Motorsports Madness here on the Performance Motorsports Network. Jacob Seelman, Tom Baker, Kyle Magda, James Pike, Joel Sebastianelli, all here at the round table. James, uh, we just sent outside because racing has just started here at the 2015 Bojangles Summer Shootout. The Masters of Disaster are on the racetrack, Tom, in a wet, in a wet race. In a, yeah, a wet race. That's exactly why the track's still wet, so the Masters is basically uh, running on a bit of a wet track. They do run the Legends in the wet here. They will not run the Bandolero cars until it's dry, but the Legends cars, they will run in the wet or even in the rain here at Charlotte as long as it's not lightning. And, of course, we're multitasking here because we're also covering this event for Race Chaser Online. So uh, James has graciously volunteered to step out and... Uh, and help with coverage while you and I continue the radio show with Kyle Magda and Joel and, uh, and the rest of the cast here on PMN. So uh, James will come back in a little later. But uh, lots of stuff going on on the IndyCar side of things. Indeed, and not just IndyCar, but I do want to wrap up something from the uh, Formula One side of life for a minute because Joel... Uh, you know, we, we finally get a little bit of a chance to breathe here with Formula One. We've got some time off before we head to Spa. You know, you've got Sebastian Vettel who won the race. You've got the Mercedes who finished outside the top five, both of them. But you've got two kids that I want to talk about for a second. Danny Kvyat, the second youngest podium finisher in F1 history behind only, yeah, Sebastian Vettel. No surprise there. And Max Verstappen, who finished fourth. I mean, these two kids are likely the future of Formula One, talk five or ten years from now. And I, and I was so impressed with Kvyat's run, especially in the Red Bull. Not only to see both Red Bull cars on the podium, but he drove like a veteran. And I was, yeah, I was very, very surprised and very impressed at the job he was able to do putting a whole race together uh, over the weekend in Hungary. Yeah, I totally agree, especially on Danny Kvyat. Uh, somebody who, even with Toro Rosso, I know at the end of the year, Belgium was actually the last time he scored points. Uh, with Toro Rosso, it was up and down, but I thought even in those races where he was down, or whether there was a retirement, whatever happened, he still showed a lot of promise. He passed the eye test if you will. And so now that he's actually with Red Bull, I think we're seeing that. Almost put it on the podium at Monaco and now at Hungary to put together such a solid drive and finish second. That's great for him. He's 21 years old, still younger than me, born in April of 1994. But however old you are, you know, if you think that makes you you know, reconsider your age and what you've done with your life. I mean, Max Verstappen's 17 years old. He was born in 1997. He is so young, but he doesn't show it. I think even the way he handles himself 
in the media is very spectacular. I mean, there are guys who are KG veterans who don't deal with the media as well as he does. And, you know, as far as dealing with other drivers, I know that he had a run in at Monaco, and, you know, some drivers were a little critical of his style, whatever. Um, you know, anytime there's a racing incident like that, there's blame to go around both ways. You can't just pin that on him as being young either because I didn't think he really did anything wrong. So for Verstappen, I think he has impressed everybody so far. Scoring in the points three times this season at Malaysia, Austria, and now Hungary. At some point, this kid's going to win a race, and it was probably going to be before he turns 21. I mean, that's the crazy thing to think about. He still has another four years before he turns 21 years old. I mean, that, that, that's just mind-boggling to me. I mean, he, he's so good and he's so young. I can't wait to see what he does with the rest of his career because he has so much of it ahead of him. Well, that's true, Joel. And, and I've, been a, I've been an advocate for Verstappen being in Formula One at 17. And, you know, I just think that he's a driver who's obviously like any other rookie, any other first year driver in a series with that much horsepower and all of that. He's green or wet behind the ears, however you want to look at it. You know, he's got some learning to do. He's going to be aggressive. He's going to make some moves a lot like Sage Karam has in IndyCar where, you know, people are, are being critical of Sage and maybe deservedly so in some cases, but these are, these are kids who are young, they're full of energy, they're very aggressive, and they've got to find the edge and find their limits. And Max, um, I think Max will surely win a race before he's 21. I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen next year. I don't know about, I don't really see him winning a race this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if sometime next year he popped up and grabbed one. But, but Joel, I think that it's a good thing for F1 to have Kvyat, to have Verstappen starting to matter and be relevant in these races because F1 needs that young blood. They need a young audience too. And you're not going to get that unless you have these guys and you get their friends and, and, and the young crowd to be able to focus on someone their age. That's what's going to draw their attention back to F1. And I think, I think that's one piece of F1's promotional aspect. that has been kind of missing for a while. Um, I think that's a very interesting point, and you're not wrong. I also think that F1, and I'm, Bernie Ecclestone will tell you this, and he's not really right, but he's not completely wrong either. F1, to a certain extent, markets itself, just by virtue of the fact that it's F1. I think it's great that they have this young talent, that it's someone that, um, you know, especially Max Verstappen being as young as he is, you know, somebody that young people can get attached to and that they can root for. But when you think about the age of just some of the established stars, like Sebastian Vettel, for example, you know, yes, he reached the 41-win plateau in a similar time to Schumacher and Senna, but especially, you know, going back to Senna's days and going back to even some of the far, far earlier days. You know, there's more races in a season. So, he yes, he's made a lot of starts, but he's also not that old. I mean, Vettel's 28 years old. So Vettel has at least another five years, if not more than that. You know, the same can be said for Lewis Hamilton, Rosberg. I think Valtteri Bottas is a young guy who, uh, when he, I think, inevitably winds up with Ferrari next year, he's another one. So it's not just Kvyat and Verstappen. Those are the two that are going to draw most eyes. But I think it actually surprises people sometimes how young some of these other guys, too, when you consider... Um, and, and I'm not, like, knocking NASCAR here, but, you know, for NASCAR, <laughs> for example, guys can race a lot longer and a lot older. These guys are still pretty young, even in Formula One terms. I like that point, Joel, and, of course, uh, it's always interesting anytime you bring a NASCAR comparison into your segment because you just don't do that most of the time. In any case, though, I do want to shift gears and get to IndyCar really quickly, headed to Mid-Ohio on Sunday, and... When you look at Mid-Ohio, you look at one driver. It's been eight years back to 2007 that we've been racing at this course since the uh, changeover to the Verizon IndyCar Series. Five wins, seven top fives, never out of the top ten, 
201 of 690 laps that he's completed. He's led an average finish of 2.5. There is nobody better at this racetrack than Scott Dixon. Nobody. He's won it from last. Yeah, that Scott Dixon guy is pretty good, isn't he? Uh, he's stellar, and he's going to need another really good performance uh, after Iowa finishing in 18th. That was maybe not a huge blow to his title hopes, but it certainly doesn't help. The average margin between first and second place uh, is 27 points. That uh, I can't take credit for finding that on my own, thanks to the stats people at IndyCar for putting that together in a press release today. So, uh, you know, Juan Pablo Montoya with three races to go in the season has a bigger than average gap over Graham Ray Hall and over Scott Dixon. I think Elio Castroneves is out at this point. Um, you know, maybe even Will Power too. But for Ooh. Scott Dixon being just 48 points back with a victory in at least one of these races, maybe some more bad luck for Montoya or Graham Rahal. I think Scott Dixon is still in the fight. So is Graham Rahal, six points ahead of Dixie, 42 back of Montoya. I think it's going to be those three who it comes down to. Although you still can't count out Elio Castroneves and Will Power. I know I just said you could. But with double points at Sonoma, I'm very curious to see how that's going to shake out because double points could flip everything upside down. I mean, the only race that Juan Pablo Montoya has really had any trouble at this year, it's been Iowa when he had the early crash a week ago, and Alabama, which was actually the only other race he finished outside the top 10. Uh, but a bad result at Sonoma, contact, something like that, I mean, that could be at a minimum, a 50-point swing, if not more than that. So we'll see, but one thing's for sure. I mean, Mid-Ohio and Pocono, Ray Hall, Dixon, Elio Power, they got to lay it all on the line right now, and I think Dixon is my favorite of guys not named JPM. Is there anybody, if you're throwing down the pick, so that's it, Scott Dixon right there? If it's not one Pablo Montoya, I would say Scott Dixon, especially for Mid-Ohio, too. I mean, he is so good here, and it's not just him. I mean, Ganassi has owned this place, too. They've all been really strong. So I think that this is definitely Dixon's race, although, hey, we've said that before about other places. And, you know, guys like Graham Rahal continue to surprise us, a first, a third, and a fourth in the last three races, four straight top tens. I mean, this guy's Second come out points. of nowhere, and Honda is going to throw all of their power behind him. They have to. You can't count out Graham either. I just think that there's a certain element of this that's a numbers game, and I like Scott Dixon to at least creep closer to Juan Pablo Montoya than he is now. All right, we'll catch up with Joel next week as we break down mid-Ohio and continue to get closer to an IndyCar championship. Right now, we're going to talk dirt after the break. Steve Ovens in the house, and hey, some Donnie Schatz guys back in victory lane. We'll talk that surprise. up next. You're listening to Motorsports Madness on PMN, the Performance Motorsports Network. Parents, your son or daughter has had their license for a while now, but you want to make sure they're prepared for any situation they may face on the road. High school driver's ed doesn't teach them to drive defensively. They need to be prepared for any highway emergency. For less than a month's insurance, and a whole lot less, BSR instructors at Summit Point Motorsports Park in nearby Summit Point, West Virginia, will teach your son or daughter how to respond instantly and positively to unexpected situations on the road. BSR's specialized accident avoidance training teaches swerve to avoid maneuvers at highway speed, ocular driving, which focuses driving attention on ways to avoid accidents, vehicle dynamics and feedback, skid control, and skid recovery, threshold braking on straights and progressive braking on curves, and off-road recovery techniques. This is stuff driver's ed simply doesn't teach. So call BSR today, 304-725-8444. Give your kid the skill set needed to drive safely and responsibly on the highway. That's 304-725-8444. You hear that? That's the sound of America's only sports car. That's right. It's a Corvette. But not just any Corvette. It's your Corvette. It's that who cares if there's traffic part of your day. And this can be you when you come to Cooper Corvettes. With 60 years of Corvettes to choose from, there's always a Corvette in your budget. And they'll service any Corvette you bring in. Cooper Corvettes. On Route 1 just north of Quantico and Triangle. Call, click, or visit coopercorvettes.com. We're growing like crazy and need account reps who know their way around agencies, the internet, and social media. Got connections? 
or do you know how to get to the decision makers? Are you fearless? We need you. Internet radio, or as we call it, wireless mobile radio, is rapidly becoming the place to be with almost limitless income potential. So contact us to get involved with the fastest growing professionally produced group of internet radio stations in the world. Your imagination is the only limit here. Call 717-749-0444. That's 717-749-0444. Or you can email us at scorpionradiogroup at gmail.com. You want to ask for Sue. Hi, this is John Androsik of Five for Fighting, here for RAD, the entertainment industry's voice for road safety. You know, style is a personal thing, and your lifestyle is your business. But if you take it on the road, it becomes everybody's business. So please, plan ahead, designate before you celebrate. Friends, don't let friends drive drunk. A public service announcement brought to you by RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. We now return you to Two and a Half Men on Speed 77 Radio's Motorsports Madness on the Performance Motorsports Network. And we welcome you back here to PMN and Motorsports Madness, live from the Charlotte Motor Speedway as we kick off the second hour of our show tonight. Home of the Bojangles Summer Shootout, where race one of the night just finished up. And for the Masters of Disaster, Tom Baker, Robbie Faggart goes to the win in the first rain race of the summer. Half-track victory, third of the last four. He's now multiplied his career wins total at the shootout in nine weeks by four. He had one, now he has four. <laughs> That would be a significant gain. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's had a good uh, last uh, month or so of the shootout. And, of course, his son Dylan also competing in the uh, summer shootout series. And uh, Dylan very capable as well. And so uh, kind of fun to see the father and son uh, teams that compete in these forms of racing. And here at the shootout, uh, Robbie and Dylan are about as good as it gets in the father-son department. Oh, for sure, since the names Van Wingerden were coming yes. here at the shootout, I think. So we'll, we'll get back to more shootout information as the second hour goes on and continue to bring you some coverage here on PMN right now. Steve Ovens joins us as we talk dirt. And Steve-O, we went to Pennsylvania where the posse is so strong and the world of outlaws say the Morgan Cup is on the line. They've never lost the Morgan Cup. Guess what? Hello, Posse. Sweep at Williams Grove Friday night and Saturday night. And wouldn't you believe it? The Posse wins the Morgan Cup for the first time at the hands of the Black Bandit himself, Stevie Smith, to victory lane for the first time in over a year Saturday night. Yeah, and you know, the thing about Stevie Smith is is I think that I don't know that anybody that was at Williams Grove had any doubt in their mind that if one guy could do it, and certainly they probably thought this after they saw Hodnett doing you know, his best Michelle Kwan uh, experience back there on the backstretch. Um, after you know, a guy like Hodnett is out of, the, out of contention, the next guy that you'd think of to, to have a chance to pull down Saturday night's win is a guy that has been red hot in Pennsylvania lately. Uh, the, the team of Stevie Smith and driving for Freddie Raymer has just been magic here in the last month or so. And, and they have been good more than just the last month. But the last month, I mean, they picked up the win. I believe it was opening night of, of Pennsylvania Speed Week. And at that point, they weren't even going to run the entire speed week. And after the win, Fred says, yeah, we're running the whole speed week. And, you know, so they had great runs all throughout speed week. And then they back it up with a huge win on Saturday night. First time the posse gets to take over the Morgan Cup uh, from the Outlaws. And I'll tell you, what a show, what a performance from a guy, a veteran racer in Stevie Smith, running a throwback paint scheme. Uh, I mean, honestly, you, you couldn't write a better story this weekend. Steve, I just want to clarify something. Did you just work Michelle Kwan into a dirt segment? 
Well, when you're following the guy that talks about Snuggies for dogs, you get you got to get creative. <laughs> Touche. That's a, Touche. That's a good point. Oh, boy. I, I mean, and, and not to discount Steve, not only did Stevie Smith win in the throwback scheme, but Friday night's feature at Williams Grove, Danny Dietrich did something that only about two guys all summer have done, period. He passed Donnie Shots for the lead and kept it. Oh, he did. And and again, if there's a guy, and, and I, you know, I, I kind of misspoke in leaving this guy out, but when when you talk about guys in, in PA that can that can talk the talk and walk the walk, Danny Dietrich is that guy. Um, this is a guy who causes, I won't say causes a lot of trouble, but he is very. Uh, he's very open with his tweets on Twitter talking about how good the Pennsylvania posse is. And again, uh, incredible performance from Dietrich on Friday night. That was a classic Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania 410 sprint car race. Um, Donnie Schatz, who, you know, you don't even have to say anything. You just say Donnie Schatz. And, and Danny Dietrich, who's a guy who, yes, at times he's gone and made some bold statements on Twitter and maybe it didn't pan out in the end. But I'll tell you, when there's a guy who will get on Twitter and say, you know, Pennsylvania is going to take the cup this year, uh, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, he called last year an event that he went and ran with the Outlaws. He told everybody he was going to go out and and beat all of the, you know, out-of-towners and went and did exactly that. But Friday night, Jacob, that took it to a brand new level. The battle, high, low, um, you know, the the slide jobs, the high, low switch, trying to make passes. Um, I gotta, I gotta take tip my hat to the, the track crew at Williams Grove for giving those guys so many lanes to work with, uh, especially on Friday night because that was uh, an instant classic. It was an instant classic. It was fun to watch. And for everything that was fun to watch about the first two nights of the three-race swing over the weekend, we get to last night, head to New York, your normal haunt, Steve. And what do we see? He's back in victory lane. Hi, Donnie Shots. How we've missed you. Yeah, I'm sure that, you know, getting beat by Danny Dietrich on Friday night, uh, and then not being able to come away with the win for the Outlaws on Saturday night. I'm sure that Donnie had quite a chip on his shoulder to reaffirm himself as as the leader and the guy to be on the World of Outlaws series. I mean, not like we didn't know that already, but when you go through and, and, and you lose a tough race like you do on Friday night and then, you know, not able to really come back and, and you know, conquer that defeat from Friday night on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, that was a team that came in on a mission. And and I just did some reading on Donnie over the weekend, Jacob, and I wasn't aware that a lot of people are talking about the fact that they're attributing Donnie's success to a more, um, putting more of a focus on his fitness program. Now, I was a little shocked with that based on his car owner, but Hey, I mean, obviously it's working for him. <laughs> so how does this work if you're Tony? Do as I say, not as I do. Is that how that goes? <laughs> I guess that's how it works. But I mean, it, it honestly, if that's if that's really what's going on, it <laughs> certainly explains how much different how, a much different Donnie that we've seen this year. You get Subway and I get Taco Bell. That's kind of how that goes. <laughs> oh, boy. I, 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 yeah, I just don't even know there. <laughs> no ice cream I'll, for you. I'll tell you what, what else was interesting, too, uh, talking about Lebanon Valley uh, last night. It was interesting to see that Stuart Friesen chose to go to Lebanon Valley running his wife Jessica's car versus running the Modified at Utica, Rome, which was running... Yeah their NASCAR Whelan All-American Series event. Um, so that was interesting, but this is not the first time we've seen Stewart make that choice. And again, I really feel like these choices we've seen this year kind of shows and, and how much success he's having in New York in a sprint car. 
I really think that this is something Stewart wants to pursue is trying to get a full-time ride in a sprint car. I mean, I don't know. He's got a lot more that he could prove in a big block modified other than winning the super dirt car series. And, and I don't know if that's, uh, he's had a few DNFs this year with a team that he started out with this year. So I don't know if it's realistic for this year, but you know, when that's the only thing you've really got left to prove in a dirt modified, th- this is really telling of what we could see in the future. Oh, it could be very telling indeed going forward, and it's something we're going to keep watching. Real quickly, though, Steve, before we cut you loose tonight, Prairie Dirt Classic for the for the uh, World of Outlaws late models. Oh, yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> if, if Friday and Saturday at Williams Grove weren't enough for you, how about a last lap pass by Superman? Jonathan Davenport does it again. Can we say he's the new king of a dirt late model yet? He is just on a tear. What a what a fantastic race between him and Dennis Herb. And they, they've they just released the highlights. I just got the those emailed to me this afternoon. So if you're if you're a dirt late model fan, go over to World of All All Eight Models, whether you catch them on the website or on Facebook. The I'll tell you that three and a half minutes you're going to be on the edge of your seat. What a finish! And and Davenport, I mean, that's got to be your odds on favorite for the for the Knoxville Late Model Nationals, hand, hands down. Gee, you think? I, I, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I think that's an understatement. I Steve, he's won every big race there is to win this year. Yeah, he has. And, you know, again, we, we talk, when you guys make picks, we always talk about going out on the two-inch limb. I mean, Davenport's your two-inch limb right now. Which is why Jacob would pick him if he... If, if, we, if were we were picking dirt late models. Yeah, you're probably <laughs> right. Uh, I'm. Mean, it, it's great. And even better, for the Outlaws, back to the sprint cars, Steve, we're going to Canada, where Donnie Schatz was undefeated last year. So... That March to 200, yeah, we're going to have some fun with that. Absolutely. Uh, they're getting ready to head to uh, Ashwikin, uh, which is owned and promoted by Glenn Styers, one of the one of the most creative and craziest promoters I think I've ever met in my life. Oh, boy. It's been fun to watch. And, Steve, we know you'll be keeping an eye on it from Maine. Bring me back some lobster when you come back. And uh, we'll look forward to catching the boys every Tuesday night on Turn 5 Live, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Absolutely. Got a lot of good stuff coming up here in the next couple weeks. And uh, looking forward to bringing you guys some good stuff from Watkins Glen here not too far from now. We're looking forward to it, Steve. That's coming up in a little over a week's time. That's Steve Ovens. We're going back to the pavement and continuing Motorsports Madness. When we come back, you're listening to the Performance Motorsports Network, the voice of motorsports. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Whew. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Media sales professionals with agency experience. If you're frustrated with your current position, unrealistic quotas, and inept management, if you're a sales machine and you simply will not take no as an acceptable reply, If you're looking for a rapidly growing company with unlimited sales potential for commissions in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you're searching for a high-tech, forward-looking, laid-back, but extremely professional organization who appreciate your skills and dedication, we have your next opportunity. Scorpion Radio Group is building a sales team of self-starters who are motivated. Your imagination is the only limit here. Call 717-749-0444 or email us at scorpionradiogroup at gmail.com. That's 717-749-0444 and ask for Sue. You hear that? That's the sound of America's only sports car. That's right. It's a Corvette. But not just any Corvette. It's your Corvette. It's that who cares if there's traffic part of your day. And this can be you when you come to Cooper Corvettes. With 60 years of Corvettes to choose from, there's always a Corvette in your budget. And they'll service any Corvette you bring in. Cooper Corvettes. On Route 1 just north of Quantico and Triangle. Call, click, or visit coopercorvettes.com. 
How to deal with someone who says that's so gay. Outsmart them. This party is like so gay. Totally. Excuse me, but did you ladies know the word gay used to mean happy or excited? Then it became a word used to describe gay people. Then somehow it came to mean dumb or stupid, which is how you just used it, which is not very nice. Ew, that guy is on the football team and super smart and he totally hates us now. Totally. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off. Learn more at thinkbeforeyouspeak.com. You're listening to Speed 77 Radio on the Performance Motorsports Network. Now back to Jacob, Tom, and Kyle on Motorsports Madness. And with 45 minutes to go, we put our second feature race of the night on the racetrack. The pros are in action, and Ryan Shattuck just took the lead after a three-car crash fighting for the lead, Tom, between Greg Lang, Jared Irvin, and Joey Paget. Oh, boy, the teammates got into it at the front of the field. Yikes. And it looks like now uh, maybe Jared Irvin. Oh, are they, are they putting him back to the like lead? Irvin's going back oh, to the geez. lead. So we spoke a little too soon. We are obviously... Broadcasting live from the Charlotte Motor Speedway, where the 22nd annual Bojangles Summer Shootout for the Legends and Mandaleros is going into race nine as we speak. The ninth uh, race in the 10 race series uh, being run and uh, lots of good stuff going on. The pro division actually on the track right now while we talk motorsports of all varieties here this evening. And uh, so a nice uh, sort of mix for us. We're uh, coming to you from the media center and a lot of action going on on the racetrack, including the top three cars getting together in the pro class and they're still sorting things out there. Yeah, speaking of the pro class and of, you know, fierce battles and different things that we can do at the Bojangles Summer Shootout, we're coming up on round 10 tomorrow night where we will see the return of something that had its fame and its heyday in the early 2000s here at the Bojangles Summer Shootout. The infamous grudge match is back. Chris Ferguson out of the Dirt Late Model Group against Burt Myers running pavement modifieds in the NASCAR Southern Tour. And, and neither Bowman of Gray them... Have, Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, basically, it's a track that you could equate to Bowman Gray Stadium here on the front stretch at Charlotte. But more importantly, neither of them have ever run a Legends car before. Well, of course, and, and Burt, very, you know, one of the drivers who competes at Bowman Gray on a regular basis is what I would say. And lots of lots of interesting stuff there james pike with the grudge match um you know you you get a head-to-head contest between two guys who've never competed in legends cars and chris ferguson's really under a lot of pressure here and let me tell you why because carson ferguson his cousin who is chris's cousin and who is much younger than chris has won a championship here two champions two championships and and numerous races so you know if Chris doesn't step it up, Carson's going to be wanting to boot him out of the seat, and he's going to have to hear about it at the next family reunion as well. And he referenced that to me a little bit ago, which is all the fun. And speaking of a little bit ago, I got the chance to catch up with both of them earlier this afternoon, where you get a chance to hear from that right now. In their own words, the grudge, the rivalry, it's the one and only Burt Myers versus the one and only Chris Ferguson. Let's hear from him now. Jacob Seelman for the Performance Motorsports Network and Charlotte Motor Speedway. Trackside with probably the most fun race that we're going to get to see the entire shootout. Fitting that it comes all the way down to the end. Chris Ferguson and Burt Myers bringing back the return of the grudge match to Charlotte. Neither one of them have ever been in a Legends car before. Chris from Dirt Late Models, Burt from Pavement Modifieds. Chris, you got fitted for this about four weeks ago. We thought you were going to face off against Eric Jones, and you get the modified guy. So how much fun is this going to be? And obviously totally different than anything you've done in the dirt car. Well, I definitely have watched a few uh, asphalt modified guys race. They like to uh, rub fenders, and unfortunately they don't do slide jobs like we do, but they're pretty good, and I think they're pretty aggressive just like us dirt guys. So uh, anytime you get to race against somebody who's at the top of their game, uh, it's always going to be fun whenever, whenever it's on a level playing field. Bert, you just got fitted for the car about 10 minutes ago. You get to take it out here in a few minutes. And same surface, completely different ball game, and completely different style than what you're used to in the modified. We don't let you be aggressive in these cars. Yeah, that's what I was asking him is uh, what, what type of driving style did you use in these? Was it an aggressive or smoother is faster? He said smoother is faster. I said, well, that might be a problem. But uh, same with the dirt late models. I mean, you know, in a modified, 
you hustle. And uh, same with these guys. So it ought to be interesting. And if nothing else, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. We know that because these are two guys that aren't afraid to r- rough the competition up just a little bit. I mean, Chris, what a season you've had. Some big dirt late model wins. I think six on the year so far. I mean, and, and you get to come and do this for fun. I mean, where where's this rank as a highlight on the year? Well, I can go ahead and tell you, it depends on how we do tomorrow night because my little cousin, as everybody knows, he, he's one of, the, one of the guys to beat in these cars. So if I don't do any good, then he's going to ride my tail the rest of the year. So uh, this is definitely a lot less stressful than what we usually run, uh, which is nice because, you know, we go out there and race every week and uh, put it all out there on the line, you know, for money, for, for uh, winning a race. You know, with this deal, we get to come out here. A lot less uh, stressful and, uh, you know, get to race cars that we don't own, which is always nice. Uh, And then also, you know, just the fact that we get to do it out on a surface that we've never been on and then in front of fans that we've hardly ever seen. So I think uh, it's up there as far as uh, being the most fun weekend of the year. You mentioned Carson. I mean, how much fun has it been to be able to come out and support him, watch him as he's worked his way up here at Charlotte? And this kid, he's, uh, he's something special. It's, uh, it's always cool to have somebody in your family to race, but it's a positive to have a, a driver, you know, a, a kid like him, prove what he's proved and win the races he has as young as he is. So uh, it's cool that uh, I get to race what he gets to race, considering he's been running some dirt late model stuff. But like I said, if I don't do any good, then he's going to be riding my tail about it the rest of the year. Bird, I watched your young son sit in one of these cars a little bit ago, and you mentioned he's had some go-kart starts, but boy, Boy, uh, carry it on the family name between you and your brother and now the little one. I mean, this has been a whole lot of fun to watch, and it looks like he's having fun out here, too. Oh, yeah. Well, you saw him. The first thing he wanted to do was get in it after I got out. Uh, he has run a couple go-kart races, but, you know, when you grow up in racing and it's all you know, um, it's, it's not a hobby for us. It's a lifestyle, and uh, I'm sure one of these days he's going to be behind the wheel of something real soon. All right, guys, uh, we'll get a photo op here. But before we do that, real quickly, I know both of you have sponsors that are here supporting you, and we want to give you a chance to shout out to them. Who makes it happen? Chris and then Bert. I got to give a special thanks to Butler Built Seats. I actually work for them, and they let me get off work two days in a row, and uh, they're helping me out a lot for this deal. And I uh, got to thank my other sponsors, Live Oak Family Dentistry and Langley Collision Center. Those guys make it possible for me to race, to even win races. And, uh, you know, when you win races, opportunities like this come up. So I got to give a big thank you to the, all of them. Not just for here, but uh, Citrus Safe Cleaners, uh, they've been around for a long time. They, they're helping us out for this event. Uh, Speedway Auto Auction, Adams Towing. And like Chris said, it, it, without the sponsor's help and our respected divisions, then you guys wouldn't have called us to be able to come out and have a great night of racing here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Well, it's about time to get the fight post going and then get them in cars. Burt Myers, Chris Ferguson, ready to go. The grudge match back in Charlotte. And we talk about the grudge match. I mean, that's going to be one of the highlights, Tom, but also champions to be crowned tomorrow night. It doesn't get a whole lot better than that. No, it doesn't. And, you know, it's a special night for these guys that race these cars. Uh, whether you're, you know, a, a young Bandolero bandit racer who's probably, you know, six or seven years old, or whether you're uh, a Masters Legends racer who's over 40 years old, it doesn't matter. The, the, the end, the last race of the summer shootout is a really special race. And winning a shootout championship is about the biggest accomplishment you can possibly have in legends car racing anywhere in the country. Um, and so it's a, it's a special, definitely a special uh, accomplishment. So, yeah, tomorrow is going to be a lot of fun and a lot of close racing. A lot of close racing. And I'll throw this at everybody. A last lap pass for the win in the pro feature. Joey Paget around Austin Hill right at the checkered flag to get it done First win of the summer for the 83 camp, and that's been a long time coming. James, he won the Winter Heat Championship. How about that, though? He's never won in the pro class at Charlotte in the shootout until tonight. Yeah, no, but I I think you hit it right on the head with a long time coming. That car's consistently gotten faster over the course of the summer, so I can't say I'm totally surprised to see that he's finally got one. And finishing in second 
was somebody the fans, a lot of our fans who watch NASCAR will recognize. Austin Hill has run, won some, or run some truck series races and K&N series races uh, coming back to his roots and mm-hmm. running for Atlantic Racing and the Legends Cars. Fine second place run for Austin. He won here last well, week. Well, he's the one that also just got bumped and run for the win. So Still a great run, though. It still is. So, you know, we got all that. Kyle Magda, really quickly before we go to break, uh, a great run over the weekend at another race that you were at. You were talking about Indianapolis earlier. Let's shift gears and go to the track across the street because Travis Braden, holy cow, wins in his ARCA debut and comes from a lap down to do it. Jacob, when I watched those last 50 laps, I don't think I've seen a more perfect drive out of anybody other than Travis Braden. Comes on a caution with 90 laps to go. He, he pretty much runs in the top five. And he is down by over five seconds to William Byron at one point during that run and runs him right down with 20 to go, passes him and wins the race. But uh, I, I think maybe his prior experience with saving his equipment may have helped him. You know, the tires, of course, helped as well. But just, just he put on, I mean, I was in awe when that happened. And him just running down and... Uh, Wow, I mean, I'm still speechless today <laughs> doing it, but I, I know I wrote it on Race Chaser Online, uh, a recap there, but Travis Braden, I mean, he turned a lot of heads, and Jacob, they have a very limited budget compared to those of Venerini, uh, GMS Racing, you know, the bigger teams, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of stories that came out of that race, William Byron making his ARCA debut uh, as well, you know, and running a Toyota, of all things, you know, him running the Chevrolet and the K&N series, so... But uh, well, what, a, what a big weekend for that thing. You know what? I, I still believe this. They need to bring NASCAR, the trucks, and Xfinity back to LOR. I'll say it probably 100 more times in the next year. But, uh, yeah, that track is just awesome. You know, you can, you can pass there. Uh, you know, you can run high at times. You can run low. It uh, just depends. You get the car right up, handled right, Jacob. And uh, who knows? It'll be a victory lane at the end of the night. Well, at, uh, I mean, Travis did do a fine job. And, and for those wondering what Travis's background is, he's actually – a Midwest racer who uh, has been attending West Virginia University uh, for the past couple of years as a student in the college, actually one of his uh, motorsports partners, so to speak. And uh, that's a tremendous win for him and a huge upset, honestly. Uh, and it, it, it probably would have been less of an upset had William Byron ended up winning, even though it was William's first start because he's in Venturini equipment. And I think all of us expected him to contend, but Travis Braden doing what he did was just amazing. And um, my hat's off to that entire team on that accomplishment. And we'll um, talk more uh, on Thursday's show about that race and look ahead to the rest of the Arca's our Arca season as well. Right now we're going to step aside when we come back. We're actually going to talk a little bit of V8 supercars with James Pike and much more still to come as we continue our live coverage from the 22nd annual Bojangles Summer Shootout at Charlotte Motor Speedway. You're listening to Motorsports Madness on the Performance Motorsports Network. You own a performance car and you know how to drive, but you want to learn real performance driving. Well, Bunky, get that car off the street and onto the track. Summit Point Motorsports Park, the Mid-Atlantic's premier road racing facility, located just over an hour from D.C. in nearby Summit Point, West Virginia, is the place to go. And you'll find that Friday at the track is going to give you what you need. For less than a monthly car payment, you can attend this regularly scheduled one-day instructional event in your street car on one of Summit Point's three world-class road racing circuits. You'll receive classroom instruction, skid pad instruction in their cars, including front and rear skid control, and four 20-minute in-your-car instructional sessions from a professional instructor. Have fun, go fast, and really learn how to drive. Call 304-725-8444 for class schedules and details. That's 304-725-8444, Friday at the track at Summit Point Motorsports Park. Every 30 minutes, another innocent person is killed due to a drunk driver. My best friend. My brother. My poor grandchild. My sister. My father. My husband. My mom. (laughs) My mommy. Stop these tragedies before they happen. Don't drink and drive. 
The Performance Motorsports Network is a compilation of shows about motorsports. From technical to controversial to just fun, everything you like about racing and gearhead stuff is right here on one internet channel. The Performance Motorsports Network. Tell your friends about it. Hi, I'm Reed Sorensen. Racing has been a part of me and my family for as long as I can remember. I had to make tough choices early on to get to the top. It took hard work and dedication. But it's those tough choices that help me prepare for challenges I would face as a cup driver. Make the right choices today and be ready for the challenges tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. Time to get back to tonight's Motorsports Madness. Here are the only three of a kind that beats a full house. Jacob Seelman, Tom Baker, and Kyle Magda. Well, in this case, for the, for the moment, it's Tom Baker, Kyle Magda, and James Pike. Jacob Seelman has stepped out from our uh, radio set here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway outside of the media center. We're actually inside. Jacob's gone out chasing a winter view with the uh, winner of the Pro Division here tonight, Joey Padgett, uh, for Race Chaser Online for our coverage. So, uh, James, uh, you and I, for the moment, will talk a little bit of V8 supercars because... A lot going on with that. We got a race coming up. And you know what, James? I, I've been a little out of the loop of the supercars the last several weeks or so, but I look at the points, the driver standings, and see that not much has changed. Max Winterbottom's still at the top, having a great season. But I think the biggest shock of it all is where Jamie Wincup is right now. He's all the way down in eighth. I think the craziest thing is that Jamie Wincup has not won a race since the second round of the season at Simmons Plains. Yeah, that's nuts. Un- unbelievable. Uh, and to think, you know, Jamie Wincup, we've seen him be so dominant these past few seasons. To see him put up finishes, 19th in Perth, 22nd and 16th in Darwin, just not finishes that are characteristic of that Number one machine. Is this an indication of extra stiff competition this year, or is this an indication that something is amiss with Jamie Wincup and that team? Uh, I'm inclined to believe that it's probably more just the fact that the Fords have put in so much work. They had to. They developed a brand-new chassis in the Falcon FJX specifically for this season, uh, and they had to put in so much work in, I guess, their summer or winter uh, to get those up to par with the rest of the competition, that it's just it's paying so many dividends. You look, three of the top five guys in the point standings, Mark Winterbottom leading, but also David Reynolds and Chaz Moster having career seasons, sitting fourth and fifth in points right now. I think it just speaks to not necessarily uh, any sort of fall off from the guys at Red Bull Racing Australia. I think it's much more just uh, it's a year of the Blue Oval. Well, which is kind of interesting that we're even discussing that because, of course, there was the whole uh, conversation about Ford pulling out of V8 supercars. And yet there, this is, this is starting to look a lot like the scenario with Dodge and in uh, sprint cup a couple of years back, Dodge says we're getting out and, uh, and Penske says, well, okay, but we're going to send you off with a championship. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you, you look at a few fun stats here. Mark Winterbottom is currently tied for a season high in wins for his career. If he gets a victory in Queensland, where we're headed this weekend for the Coates Hire Ipwich Super Sprint, he will set a new record for number of wins in a season just for himself. This may very well be the strongest we've ever seen, Frosty. This might be the year that he finally usurps the boys at Red Bull Racing Australia and gets a championship as Ford decides to exit the sport officially. The irony, right? It is, it is irony, and of course, if you want a little more irony, you can say, well, you know, Mark Winterbottom in the season he's having and, and maybe finally breaking through for a championship, Kyle Busch, NASCAR Spring Cup, finally breaking through for a championship. So some interesting storylines across the globe, um, but sticking with, with this, we, we were all excited about the return of Marcus Ambrose to this series going into the season, and of course, Marcus several months ago now stepped out of the car uh, and has kind of been off the radar for a little while, though there seem to be some rumors about 
the potential for him to maybe come back to NASCAR of all things. Um, what are you hearing about the status of Marcus Ambrose right now with that Penske owned team over there? And where do you see him? I mean, do you see him staying? Do you see him being successful? What did tell us what you know about Marcus's status right now? Well, Marcus is in a very interesting and very difficult to read position, I think. Officially, he's still sorting out and deciding his future. He's dropped some lines to the newspapers over the past few weeks where he said, you know, I'm still just trying to figure it out and feel it out and see if, you know, coming back to that 17 ride is the best thing for me. Uh, whether or not he stays, I'm not sure. I thought that the scenario in which he departed that right at the beginning of the season was very odd to begin with. Uh, and Scott Pye has proved himself to be more than competent, especially at a young age. Uh, he's got room to grow and he's got time to learn. So uh, I think uh, you're probably looking at a situation next year where Pye is the lead driver for DJR Team Penske. Uh, there may very well be a scenario in which Marcus Ambrose comes back and they expand to the second car. So, uh, you know, just uh, I think they'll sort this out. They'll have some time, too, as we start leading into the Pure Tech Enduro Cup. And I think that once we get to the likes of Bathurst and Surfers Paradise, we'll probably know a little bit more as far as what DJR Team Penske's plans will be for 2016. Well, as you, as you say, uh, you know, Pi's performance is definitely, especially over the last four or five starts, his performance has definitely picked up. So we know the team is getting better and is doing better um, you just have to wonder what kind of a role that's going to play, Jacob, in Marcos's decision making in terms of whether or not he decides to take another shot at it or maybe decides to do something else. Could do either of you and I'll throw this to you first, Jacob, do either of you see a scenario where Marcos simply retires? No, okay. I don't, because at the end of the day, I've already heard some rumors right here about this driver coming potentially back to the states at the end of this year I mentioned if it that doesn't ha if it doesn't happen during the enduro races marcos may be back trying for a spot in nascar amazingly in 2016 don't know how it's going to shake out yet but in the meantime james pike we has a race this weekend i is excited we're going to ipswich you're so excited that it's got you all out of sorts with your grammar which i think i did that on purpose oh i know i know i know but i just like to rib you a little bit but yeah Queensland Raceway, uh, what has become a mainstay on the calendar since it first appeared in 1999. It's a very interesting track because if there were a pure test track on the supercars calendar, this is about as good as you get on that front. It's probably the most simple design. It is their version of the paperclip. We have Martinsville. They have Queensland because it is kind of shaped like a paperclip. I'd call it more of a seat, but... Uh, it's very flat track, lots of long, flowy corners, a few hairpins, double apexes, and a lot of long straightaways that you need to make sure you nail your corner exit on so that you can carry some speed into the straightaway, otherwise you lose a tenth or two. You add to it the fact that it's literally just built in a field, and they built all the grandstands around it. It gives the whole place an illusion that it's larger than it actually is, which tends to make drivers a little bit more aggressive, especially running through the corners than they normally would be, Tom, and... I think we're going to see a few folks run off into the grass just a little bit. The interesting thing is that you describe it as a paper clip. You're describing that because it's flat, not because it's an oval. Right. Just correct. to clarify that right. for our audience. Yes, correct. They didn't suddenly start oval racing in V8 Supercross. Though I think it's oval not Martinsville. Come on, come on. Let's stop and consider that oval racing might be really fun for V8 Supercars. That would be But really that's a topic for another We're day, in I think. In the go. meantime, the topic will be whether Red Bull Race in Australia, James, can come back because they have been unstoppably good at this racetrack over the past couple of seasons between Jamie Wincup and Craig Lowndes except for the Sunday race, the big show. Yeah, it's, it's very weird how that's worked out. They've won eight of the last 11 races between those two drivers at Queensland, but all of those victories have come on Saturday and not on Sunday. And on Sunday, past two years, it's been the likes of James Courtney and Chaz Mostert back when he was with DJR before he made the Jump to Pro Drive. So uh, I think... You'd like to think that given that this is Red Bull's test track, given that they have a history of success here, if there's a place where they can start turning things around, 
This has got to be probably the number one spot on the list before the Enduro Cup, Jacob. It may well be the number one spot that they can start to make the turnaround because right now Pro Drive is just unbelievable. Mark Winterbottom, could this finally be the year that he gets the championship? I mean, Chaz has been great. I mean, even David Reynolds has been really good. And you stop and consider Craig is still second in the championship, though that margin continues to grow larger and larger and larger. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think he hit it right on the head. You look at guys like, and even Fabian Coulthard, who's third in points running with Brad Jones. David Reynolds, who's in a contract year and has finally stepped it up here in the middle of the year and performed like the man we thought he was going to be when he took over that ride with Rod Nash Racing at the start of 2012. So uh, a lot of fun. I think those two guys, if we continue the pattern of Red Bull not finding success on Sunday, I look at those two, and I think those are the two guys that probably would be most likely to win that Sunday race and make some sort of jump, maybe get a little bit of momentum built up. Because you remember, we've got this round, we've got Sydney Motorsport Park, and then we're at it. We're at the Pure Tech Enduro Cup. Third race out is Sandown. Woo! So, uh, lots of fun, all sorts of craziness that's going to happen over the weekend. I, I, I can say I'm excited, but uh, given that I won't necessarily be in the country, I'll just make sure that I watch it on DVR because Superview gives you that capability, right? Not only does Superview give you that capability, but CBS Sports Network does too, and I actually got to see the Townsville round over the weekend on CBS SN. That was a lot of fun for me, especially here in the States, to be able to go back and see it again. And see it on proper TV, too. Right? So. I was so excited about that. It was fantastic. I have a bandit sighting out the window. Some of the drivers, <laughs> we're not ready to go we're Bandolero. We're talking about crooks here. We're talking <laughs> no. about bandit division racers. Yeah, Bandolero drivers, 8 to 11. They decided they were going to come by the window and say hi. And I have a feeling they may be invading our space here in just a minute because that's just what they do. In the meantime, Kyle Magda, as a prelude to our picks, I want to bring you back in on this. We're getting ready to go to Pocono. We can draw a lot of things from Indianapolis because, hey, one of the three corners at Pocono was designed because of Indianapolis. Yeah, Pocono is three unique corners. Turn one is like the old Trenton Speedway, New Jersey. Uh, turn two is like Indianapolis, Jake. The tunnel turn. The tunnel turn. Yeah, very one of the most uh, interesting turns in NASCAR. And then, you know, turn three is like Milwaukee. The little Milwaukee Mile, which uh, IndyCar still runs. But, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I just hope that it's a little better of a race, uh, Jacob, uh, in, in June. I mean, pretty much it was Martin Truex just got away from everybody and no one could catch him. You know, Kevin Harvick probably had a good car to get there, but just could not, just didn't have the time around the laps. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go back there. You know, the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, ARCA Series, back on a doubleheader on Saturday. I'm really looking forward to the weekend, Jacob, and I hope uh, you know we can have good races, and hopefully the rain stays away. Uh, you know, since that's our always uh, tied into Pocono, Jacob. Shh! Don't say that word around. It won't race. matter because you know what Pocono always does that, or not, unless I've been showing up as of late. So he does have a point. In the meantime, before he can break the internet or find some more rain that we don't want, we're going to take our final break here on Motorsports Madness, and when we come back. It's time for performance picks because we got a lot of racing ahead this weekend from Charlotte Motor Speedway, home of the Bojangles Summer Shootout. You're listening to Motorsports Madness on PMN, the Performance Motorsports Network. Okay, so Sarah, I'm dropping you off at Emily's? Yep. And Josh, you're going to? Soccer, Dad. Soccer practice. Right. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know when I pick you both up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep. And my dorky dad hat, and I'm going to do my dad dance for all your friends. They'll love it! Seriously? Why? Because I like my short shorts. Of course, I could be talked out of it if you guys would just buckle up your seatbelts without giving me a hard time. It's important to get your kids to buckle up for safety, no matter what it takes. And sometimes, all it takes is your parental powers of persuasion. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Good choice. I'll just have to do my dad dance at dinner time. What, what? No! no! Do what you have to to make sure your kids are wearing their seatbelts, even on short drives. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. Parents, your son or daughter has had their license for a while now, but you want to make sure they're prepared for any situation they may face on the road. High school driver's ed doesn't teach them to drive defensively. They need to be prepared for any highway emergency. For less than a month's insurance, and a whole lot less, 
BSR instructors at Summit Point Motorsports Park in nearby Summit Point, West Virginia, will teach your son or daughter how to respond instantly and positively to unexpected situations on the road. BSR's specialized accident avoidance training teaches swerve to avoid maneuvers at highway speed, ocular driving, which focuses driving attention on ways to avoid accidents, vehicle dynamics and feedback, skid control, and skid recovery, threshold braking on straights and progressive braking on curves, and off-road recovery techniques. This is stuff driver's ed simply doesn't teach. So call BSR today, 304-725-8444. Give your kid the skill set needed to drive safely and responsibly on the highway. That's 304-725-8444. This is a test to find out if you know it all when it comes to children. Name one of the leading killers of U.S. children age 1 to 13. What's the best way to protect children in a car crash? At what age and size should a child start using a booster seat? Don't assume you know it all when it comes to car seats for your child. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat and know for sure. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Spencer Davis, driver of the 79 Coors Light 21 meets 21 Pontiac in the NASCAR wheel and Southern Modified Torque. Now back to Speed 77 Radio's Motorsports Madness on PMN, the Performance Motorsports Network. Welcome back to the Madness. Here, our last time this summer, live from Charlotte Motor Speedway, Jacob Seelman, Tom Baker, James Pike, and then Kyle Magda joining us on remote from Pennsylvania. It's time for performance picks, gentlemen, because uh, we had a pretty action-packed weekend this weekend, and I would have picked last if it weren't for Jeff Gordon at the Brickyard on Sunday, but in a way, I guess it's a little bit of a blessing because it means I get to pick first going into this weekend instead with some races that I think I can make up a whole lot of points in. So let's get at it, shall we? You just want to pick all the two-inch limbs. That's where you're going. Well, there's some of them that I think are really going to pay off this weekend. We're uh, Just a disclaimer for our fans at home. We're actually publishing six picks via Race Chaser Online for the weekend. We're only going to give you the four major series on the air. Trucks, Xfinity Cup, and IndyCar. So just, just be prepared for that. But in the meantime, I'll start with the truck race at Pocono on Saturday afternoon. This guy's back in a truck for the first time. He's going to do exactly what he did in the Xfinity race when he made his return and win. Give me Kyle Busch. Thank you. Big Mike behind the glass. Take note, we need a special sound effect for two-inch limb alert. And every time Jacob goes there, we need like a ding or a buzzer or some sort of a sound effect. <laughs> Get ready, because here comes the second. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes the second, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal it from an idea that you gave me earlier. This guy almost won at the Brickyard on Saturday in the Xfinity race. He's going to use his frustration as motivation. Ryan Blaney goes to win at Iowa and makes it two series that he's won at at that racetrack. Got his first truck win at Iowa back in 2012. I'll take Ryan Blaney for the Xfinity race. The cup race at Pocono, I so badly want to say Kyle Busch, but if I do that, then he won't win. So I'm Bush not going to do it, and he's probably going to win again. But in any case, I'll take the guy who finished second to Martin Truex at Pocono over uh, the Surprise. June race, Surprise. Kevin Harvick. And for the IndyCar race, I gave the stats. I'll stand by it and go with Joel because I picked him anyways earlier today. Scott Dixon makes it 6 for nine in the IndyCar race. Let's see. Who's next? Um, That would be James Pike, as a matter of fact. You're next because you were second worst of the rest of us. Yeah, Ola, Ola six-pack there didn't do me too much help, but let's see. I was looking at the results for the Pocono race last year for the trucks, and of the folks that are returning to run that race this year, I believe, if my math and my eyes correct, that the highest returning finisher is Eric Jones. So I think I'll take Eric Jones for the truck race. He's been kind of good everywhere else, too. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's got a very, very good penchant for that. Um, let's see. I think when we go to Iowa, though, for some reason, I'm really inclined to take Ryan Reed. And I don't quite know why, but I... 
I like that pick. So and, well, and his teammate won the spring race there. Right, right. And his, Ryan was on, Ryan led to that final restart. He was just on old tires. Right, right, right. And I feel like it's it's time to pick him again. I haven't picked him to win in the Nationwide Series or Xfinity That's Series. That's a buck. Yeah, the, 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 you're you're welcome, both of you. But. Uh, I haven't picked him since he won the opener in Daytona. So let's go back on that train. So we'll take Ryan Reed for Nationwide. Uh, Cap- That's another buck. Xfinity. Well, one of these days it'll start clicking. Uh, I am going to be the one that bites the bullet and goes with the two millimeter limb and takes Kyle Busch <laughs> to win at Pocono because, because I left it open. Right, right. I, and somebody's got to claim it. And you just, even if you get burned, you're not going to feel bad for it because no, no one you're will not. blame you at this point with the kind of role he's on. And then IndyCar, well, see, I had my stats here, and I was about to pull them out, and I was about to take Scott Dixon, and then, <laughs> well, now I can't take Scott Dixon anymore. So how about uh, top dude in points one, Pablo Montoya, to win at Mid-Ohio? If nothing else, it'll probably be a decent points day, and I'll be able to keep what I believe is an IndyCar points lead, is it not? You have the IndyCar points lead, and you are behind Kyle Magda for the overall lead by 17 points, sir. So good for you. <sighs> <laughs> Tom, you missed being able to pick last by one point, and you have cut the gap to 120. So oh, congratulations. Gee, I'm sorry, I missed out on that privilege. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, you, you left me some three inch limbs. Price of the rice music there. Uh, so we'll see how this works out. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm going to start uh, differently than you guys did. I'm going to start with the Indy cars. And you know what? I know a hot hand when I see one and I'm going to ride this horse. Well, the, the normal phrase is I'm going to ride the horse till the leg breaks. I don't want to see Graham Rahal break his legs. So we're just going to say, I'm going to keep riding with Graham Rahal until he slips up. And I'm sticking with Graham Rahal to win at mid Ohio in the IndyCar series in the truck series. Since Kyle Busch is gone and Since you left me with a brilliantly placed Kevin Harvick in the junior motorsports truck, and since the last time a cup driver got into that truck at Charlotte, he won. Casey Kane won. Good finish, too. uh, Although three out of the four corners were a little screwed up. Yeah, well, do we care? But the fact fact is, it still keeps the win. The left rear was good, Tom. Yeah, that's what the left rear was okay. Uh, So I'm going with Happy Harvick. Hey, win. he's won at Pocono in the truck before, too. Yes. I was there and for that, too. So I'm going with Happy Harvick to win in the trucks. The Xfinity Series, all the truck drivers, or all the cup drivers this time, they're normally in Xfinity, we're all running trucks because that's the companion race. So that means an Xfinity driver is actually going to win the Xfinity race this weekend. You took uh, Ryan Blaney, who I would have picked had you not picked him. <laughs> so I'm going to revert. To the guy I picked last week, Daniel Suarez is going to get the win. And he has been darn good lately, too. Three straight yes. top six finishes. And in the Cup Series, because the two-inch limb is gone with Kyle Busch. And, and the three-inch limb is gone with Kevin Harvick. And b- but because Chevrolet is still the hot hand at Pocono, but not in this season right now. I'm going with Denny Hamlin to get back to victory lane. Do you see what I did there? Long way around to get I to I see Toyota. what you did there. Like Denny, Hamlin right there. Pocono. Denny Hamlin gets back to victory lane after being away a while at Pocono in the Cup Series. Did I miss anything? No, okay. you're good. By default, that means, Kyle Magda, you won the weekend by virtue of Kyle Busch winning the Brickyard. You have picks to make, sir. Let's have them. Oh, and by the way, Jacob, I'm going to do this right now. I'll take a bow for you all. Thank you. Just make so, your picks. Uh, picks this weekend. Uh, I'm not taking the Kyle Busch pick that James has because I don't th- I don't believe in that, but I'll start with the trucks first. Uh, we did pick two cup guys already, but guess what, guys? There's still two more cup guys that still have not been taken. Uh, this driver I'm going to pick, uh, you picked the top two guys I wanted to pick, but that's okay. I'll take the other one, Brad Keselowski. Never ran a truck at Pocono, so may, may as well go with them. So, uh, and then for Xfinity... I will take uh, this driver has not won yet this year, actually. And you know what? He was within two laps of winning this race in May. So why not go chase Elliott? He has a Canaan win there. So uh, we'll roll the dice with him. And then for the cup race, I'm going to go on the one inch limb because you know what? This driver I'm going to pick, 
He hasn't won a race at all this year. And guess what? The guy I picked for the Xfinity race is taking over his ride next year. So why not go out and style at Pocono for Jeff Gordon? Uh, last it would start be there. his seventh win at Pocono. Yeah, so why not? Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, you know what? I'm feeling a little feisty, so I may as well do that. And then for IndyCar, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm feeling like an underdog this weekend is going to win. How about Luca Felipe? Wow. Because he was second at, he was second at, um, Toronto, is it Toronto? Yeah. So why not? Let's, let's, wow. let's go on a little limb a little bit. That's let's a go with, big limb. So let, let's try that. We'll see how that goes. You know, I, I think I picked Simona the one week and then she didn't run. So, uh, yeah. So let's try Luca Felipe. Maybe. I admire your that. courage, Kyle. So I, well, I, I picked the courage. I picked Graham Ray Hall at Iowa when he came back from, was it a lap down or something? And he finished fourth. Uh-huh. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, those are my picks. And, uh, look by, but hey, by the way, because I got distracted by the fact we have a brilliant, uh, or we had a brilliant young lions race brewing until I think they just hit the time limit. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we wrap that up just like that seven laps shy of the finish. But, uh, your truck pick, which of the cup regulars that we didn't pick did you pick? I took Brad Keselowski because Austin. Dillon. I was going to guess that. Well, I did. I did say Brad Keselowski, but Austin Dillon's a defending winner of the race, and he's in it as well. So. Yeah, he's the only he's the only Cup regular we haven't picked. So, yeah. all right, with that, we are almost done here tonight. Uh, about seven minutes left to wrap it up, Tom. First to you, final thoughts. Uh, I mean, what what a night. What you know, and and we're closing the shootout tomorrow night with a fireworks show and six champions. The last time we get to sit here doing a radio show this summer, I'm a little disappointed. I'm bummed. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll be back uh, not for the radio show, but back covering the uh, Cup weekend in October. But yeah, it's it's really a um, it's been a lot of fun, and I really have to say thank you to uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway, Lenny Batecki and his staff, uh, everybody here at CMS for allowing us to be. Uh, so much a part of the Bojangles Summer Shootout Series this year. Um, and this is, uh, for those of you listening who are not really familiar with Legends Cars, if you think about NASCAR, you got the Bush Brothers, you got Reed Sorensen, you got David Reagan, you got Daniel Hemrick in the Truck Series. whole bunch of uh, drivers coming out of Legends Cars have, have successfully made the transition up, and more are doing it uh, every day with the K&M Pro E Series. And so... My final thought, I think, would be that this summer shootout is coming to a really glorious end tomorrow night. We're going to crown six champions, and this is going to be a special night because several of the points battles going to still be on the line right tomorrow. Down to the right down to the wire. Right down to the wire. James Pike, uh, I'll give you your final thought in a couple of different ways. Number one, obviously a lot of racing this weekend between Pocono and Iowa. More importantly, though, I mean, you've this is your first shootout along for the ride with all of us. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts as we kind of put a wrap on our PMN coverage here live from Charlotte? And, oh, by the way, we just crowned a first-time winner this summer, Alex Reese to Victory Lane and the Young Lions. You and I have been waiting all year for that. Yeah, yeah, the, another one of those long-time coming victories, I love Joey Padgett in the pro class. But, uh, yeah, no, it's it's been so much fun to actually do this. I've known that you guys have been... Here for a while, uh, not only covering the shootout, but also doing the shows here over the course of the summer. And uh, class and collegiate commitments have kept me from being able to come here to Charlotte and do these live with you guys. So uh, to finally have my first crack at it in the very last weekend, uh, it's a little bit bittersweet, but it's been a ton of fun coming here to do this tonight. It's been such a blast coming here to cover the shootout and really be a part of it properly for the first time. I did intern under one Lenny Baticki a few years ago, but uh, me not necessarily being in the country for a few weeks uh, will keep me out for a significant amount of time, though we'll still make sure you get your supercars, Phil. We'll have uh, sort of recorded segments, if you will, to take care of all that. So you'll get your Pure Tech Enduro Cup coverage, don't worry. And but, lots of writing for Race Chaser Online. Oh, too, and can. of course, of course, but yeah. It's Bye been guys. fun, Kyle Magda. We're headed to your neck of the woods this yes, week you are. Pocono, which I know is what you're excited about. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Like I said, we have the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series and ARCA Series back on Saturday, which is a good move uh, in Pocono's part because uh, they have not been drawing for that ARCA race on Friday the last two years. Even with all the talent they've had there, Chase Elliott, Eric Jones, Corey LaJoy, uh, just not getting the job done, moving back. 
to Saturday, and Windows 10 will be sponsoring the Cup race on Sunday, the Windows 10 400. So, uh, yeah, it's a really big weekend up in the Poconos, you know, a big month, actually. Uh, you know, even in the Northeast, you know, we have the IndyCar race there on August 23rd. Also, we have the uh, Watkins Glen next week as well, and then we have Canaan East at Motordrome. So it's a busy month for me, but I'm really looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to Pocono first, Jacob, and then, uh, you know, we'll knock out the rest, and then we'll go from there. We will, and for right now, uh, I've just I want to say that this has been a special summer for me, being able to come to a place where I literally grew up. This is where I got my first race and fix at the summer shootout to be able to bring Motorsports Madness, which I started with two years ago now, to uh, you know to a national stage here at Charlotte and be able to have a lot of fun with it. It's been a whole lot of fun to watch. So thanks to Lenny Batiki, all the staff at Charlotte and uh, and PRN for helping us to make all this possible. And right now. As we say goodnight for Tom Baker, James Pike, Kyle Magda, Joel Sebastianelli, Steve Ovens, Big Mike behind the glass for PMN. I'm Jacob Seelman. Race fans, keep it off the wall until we meet again. And we might just see you next time at the racetrack for the final time this summer from Charlotte. Good night. You've been listening to Motorsports Madness with the Speed 77 Radio Race Chaser Online crew. Stay tuned to Performance Motorsports Network for more race talk. For the latest motorsports news, visit racechaseronline.com. Motorsports Madness is a copyrighted production of the Performance Motorsports Network. www.performancemotorsportsnetwork.com. A member of the Scorpion Radio Group, Inc. and may not be rebroadcast, replicated, or saved in any media without the explicit written permission of PMN. Check out our Facebook page or our section on the PMN website. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the host, co-host, and guests, and do not necessarily reflect those of the management and ownership of either the Performance Motorsports Network or Scorpion Radio Group Incorporated, the advertisers, or the marketing partners. Be listening again next week when the madness returns on Monday night at 7 Eastern. Until then, keep it off the wall and keep the shiny side up.